My daughters are really into watching Doctor Who right now, but only the Jodie Whittaker 13th Doctor. So what I realized the other day when I was talking to a friend of mine about Doctor Who is their Doctor will be the 13th Doctor, will be Jodie Whittaker. That'll be the standard. So then when they, when they see Matt Smith, they'll wonder what the heck, why is it a guy? Albeit he's got quite long floppy hair. Not as floppy as Jodie Whittaker's, but it's quite long and floppy. That's true. There's a there's a kind of a there's a hair thing going on, even with actually, Tom Baker. Actually, 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 when it regenerated to Matt Smith, didn't he sort of like say, "Look at his hair," or like say, "Oh, am I a girl? Am I a girl?" No. Damn. Right. Damn. And then fish sticks, just yeah, lots and lots of fish sticks and custard. Li I think Lionel doesn't watch Doctor Who at all. Or have you seen any Doctor Who? He I've seen so I've confused. seen several episodes, but you know how long Doctor Who has been. Running? I believe we do. Don't we know? Like, roughly the same amount of time I've been on this planet. I think the first Doctor Who episode was in 1963. Yeah, it was the day or the day after the Kennedy assassination. It was. It was the day so, of the Kennedy oh, assassination. Oh, wow. That was the day that my parents got married. Wow. Obviously yeah. enormously significant right. in space and time. It's a convergence. It was. <laughs> Wait, okay, but hang on a second. Since we're all here and we're all talking about this right now. All right. What is it about Doctor Who? I mean, it's a very long-running show. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. But w what has what has propelled it for so long? And what I mean is just sheer inertia, or is there some? Th what's what's the what's the big picture with Doctor? Because I know some people are hugely into it, and it's a massive cultural phenomenon. But I never got it because I didn't I didn't chop in the time to watch it. So, Lyle, can I ask you, did you like Star Trek? No. Okay, we didn't like Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, no, I didn't I dislike it. I felt it was perfectly okay, and I love science fiction. And I didn't dislike... Star Trek was a little... I never really encountered Star Trek when it first came out. Actually, my first real intersection with Star Trek in a major way was me and Jim sitting yeah. down and watching the next generation like when the first episode came out of the next generation we thought that was kind of fun but it wasn't like earth shouting but anyway to answer your question no i remember that moment yeah yeah why do you uh, bill, so you know um i was going to introduce bill bill um okay sorry go ahead <laughs> uh uh bill by bill i mean dr william hannage is a professor of the evolution of Epidemiology of Infectious Disease at Harvard and the co-director of the Center of Communicable, Communicable Disease Dynamics. Um, but we're going to talk about Doctor Who. We don't have um, to. I'm just, yeah. I just no, no, I, 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 perfectly good, actually. I just thought, you know, we kind of introduced the guest before we get too deep. Um, but I remember the moment when we were watching the very first uh, Next Generation, and uh, it was in your studio apartment on Lotus Lotus Street? Locust. Yeah. Locust Street. So Locust a, Street. That's a bit of a grim name for a street. It's like yeah. A, yeah. Well, it's named yeah. after trees. It's in Philly. They named the they name the streets after trees. There's right. a walnut and a chestnut and a locust. And I guess there's a tree called a locust. I'm hoping there's a tree called there a is. locust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a locust tree, and spruce, and so forth and so on. No Very ginkgo. Imaginative. There's no, lots of ginkgos no. around. There's lots no of ginkgo, ginkgo trees, street. but no ginkgo yeah. street. But anyway, we digress. Yes, what is it um, about Doctor Who? I think there's I think there's something very significant about Doctor Who, and I think it's actually uh, it's 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 interesting to get a perspective from someone who grew up across the pond on that little island in the Atlantic, um, because it is distinctly not American. Although they're trying mm. to have a they're trying to do an American version, which is a terrible idea. But yeah, it oh. doesn't, it's just it doesn't really work. In no, American the American context. Doctor. Yeah, American Doctor. Yeah, no, no, no. There was a thing with um, Noah Weil a few years ago. They called it the librarians. Some of that was obviously trying to be like it. But no, I think mm. the thing about Doctor Who is that it's profoundly not about doing things together in a kind of federated way, as you might say. I was thinking of Star Trek because Star Trek was like, you know, don't get me wrong. I love the future that Star Trek imagines. It's great. Not sure we're ever going to get there, but I love the future. But the part of me that would never be able to wear a uniform just couldn't get my head around that. I would never be able to get my head around that. The part of me that just is uh, kind of 
um, ornery and doesn't want to be a member of any club that would have me as a member. It feels much more kind of in tune with Doctor Who. And oh. plus the fact that the character seems to fall through space and time just getting out of trouble at the last minute um, while talking very quickly is kind of an inspiration. And there's a very anti-military aspect to it. I think it's become more pronounced in the newer versions of Doctor Who, but the Doctor is always saying, you know, no, we're not going to shoot them. No. Yes, we have a great big gun that fell, you know, that the Jadun just dropped, but we're not going to use it. We're going to use our wits. And um, I don't yeah, know, I think yeah, that's yeah, very yeah. appealing. The, 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 the Doctor can defeat a bunch of aliens with a jelly baby. Right. Jelly baby. What, what's, what, what's, what's a jelly baby in American? I used to, I did, a gummy. I used to, a gummy, gummy bear? Yeah, gummy yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, so that's sort of Tom an, Baker. That was great. It's sort of an Odysseus thing. One one person once told me that Star Trek was the the most quintessential American thing because basically it's you're riding through space in like your big TV room watching the big screen TV. You know, you're sitting in your big comfy chair watching a big <laughs> screen TV and firing missiles at people. And I was like, yeah, exactly. It's like an NFL game as as a as a uh, as a science fiction show. But yeah, I get so Doctor Who because he's. It's like a MacGyver kind of vibe or an Odysseus kind of vibe. He's he's thinking his way out of stuff. That's absolutely right. And, you know, for whatever reason or not, um, my kids do, um, for some reason, they all, my entire family seems to like the Odyssey. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, which is a whole, which is a whole side thing. You know, I've got a deep hinterland. You got a who? A deep hinterland. I can, you know, it's not just Doctor Who. It's not just it's, it's the Odyssey. It's Odysseus and all that kind of stuff as well. Greek myths, wicked. Yeah. So, you, did um, you start reading Greek myths to them early on, or how do they find their their interest in it? Well, I think my um, it was there's these amazing comic books which are being done by like, various updated Greek myths, and I kind of looked at them and thought, oh, these are all going to be sanitized. They're actually not that sanitized. Yeah. You can read these things, and they are like suitable for nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds. But you can see that Zeus is not being particularly, um, how shall we say, monogamous, right. um, and <laughs> getting hard into, to edit that out. Yeah, yeah, getting, yeah. getting into trouble. And there's also some kind of fairly with a swan, yeah, very <laughs> liberal Dude. kind of. <laughs> Interspecies dynamics going oh, on there. Yeah. Lots of horizontal gene transfer. You know, that yeah, kind no. of, uh, yeah. Um, That's, that can't be good. Yeah, um, <laughs> but the, but the thing is, um, uh, you know, my eldest daughter was talking to me, saying, "Ooh, look at this. This is like, you know." She was really excited by the family trees at the front of the book, and she really wanted to know about that. And I was kind yeah. of saying, well, "You know that one of the things I do at work is I look at how different." diseases are related, different viruses and things like that, and I try and trace back to origins and stuff like that. And she just said, yeah, I know, you go on about that all the time, but I'm interested in gods. <laughs> <laughs> I'm designing a wormhole that yeah. will allow us to travel to the... Yeah, Dad, great, okay, but... <laughs> yeah, so well, I, 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 like, I like these things. And so <laughs> they got in... So she got into those things, and then, yeah, sort of followed on from that. And, you know, it's interesting because the Greek myths are deeply you know, problematic in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, you know, one of the things I bought for the same daughter whose birthday will be coming up soonish is they've got the, there's a book of gender swapped Greek myths, which is oh. actually really, really interesting. Don't, I'm hoping that she's not going to listen to this. Yeah. Um, so it'll be a surprise. <laughs> but it, it is that problematic in a lot of ways. But in terms of storytelling, there's something kind of fascinating to think that there's that all the way back then, thousands of years ago, certain yeah. sort of themes and tropes and stuff, which will go all the way through to Star Trek, Doctor Who, and so on and so forth. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I started reading. Uh, I think it was Perseus. We got we got started mm. on, and then they had me read whatever I could I, until I got to the Iliad, and then they were like, "Dad, stop! You got to stop! No, I don't." I don't care how many boats there were. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not, yeah. The, the Iliad is, <laughs> a, is a is a hard slog. Yeah, I mean, it I really know they is. wrapped the fat around the lamb five times and then roasted it in such a manner, but it's just really not. It's not great. Yeah, I'd rather just like you know, I'd, I'd rather get the recipe book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Iliad and Odyssey rest cookbook. <laughs> it's like get I, a slab of meat. Uh, I read this guy wrote meat. He wrote Based small it with the tears of your defeated enemies. <laughs> That's right. yeah. 
Where do we get those? Is that on Amazon? <laughs> Check it. Hey no, Siri, whole foods. where do I get tears of my defeated enemies? Postmates, I think. Postmates. It, it depends. It depends on how many enemies <laughs> you have defeated, because if, mm. obviously, if there's a lot of them, it's cheaper than if there's only a few, because they have to provide right. the tears. <laughs> It's good, and it helps if you've been marinating for ten years outside the city walls. That's mm. always that's always a, a plus. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> a little difficult to like put together on a short notice for a dinner party. I've got to right. say, if you true, could, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where's the dinner party again? Wait, a turkey? Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, save the date. <laughs> ten years from now. I would love you to turn up outside the city called Troy, and we're going to have an absolutely wonderful dinner party. Please let me know you can make it because there's going to be a lot of preparation involved. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I would go. Um, Bill, we had you on after because, because, okay, long story leading up to this, um, 20 years ago, I took my band to, to England to play, and... Um, we we got as far as Scotland and we, we came around and uh, walked on the borders and then we walked back. But the first gig we did, I believe it was the first gig, was a place called the Borderline, strangely, Borderline, I believe, in, in London, in Soho. And, um, and Bill was there. And uh, he found me on Twitter and he said, well, you know, um, I, I saw you all these years ago at this show. And do you want to get a coffee? And, uh, you know, immediately I... Um, I, I just checked to see if I was, you know, being watched or something. And, and but um, I was like, heck, you know, I haven't been out. It's, you know, we've been, we, I haven't really had any socials. I haven't gone out and met someone, and had a cup of coffee. I used to, do, I used to do that all the time. So I was, uh, I was intrigued, and, and and so I did. And we uh, talked for about two hours, and it was fantastic. And um, and of course, one of the things that came up uh, was what you do. And I said, well, you know, would do you want to come and be a guest on the podcast? And we cannot talk about your specialty because yeah. I think that you spend a lot of time talking about uh, your specialty because it's kind of important right now, which is an infectious disease. Um, but that's all yeah, solved, yeah, and we're all done with that. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. yeah, obviously, yes. Um, I would say I would I would agree with you, but I'm afraid that there are some people on Twitter who might take offense at that. But, oh, what did I, how did, what, what did I say that it was offensive on? Oh, Twitter? No, no, believe me, somebody on Twitter can find something to take offense at in literally oh, anything. True. It's yeah. one of the first laws. Well, we've uh, already we've done that just by talking about Doctor Who and Star Trek: The Next Generation at all. In any way, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're we're done for in that the hate has already started. Nobody's even heard it yet. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the hate has been pre-ordered. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. just can't wait. I mean, I think that's a sign of success when you start to get extreme hate oh, yes. on, on yes, Twitter. Certainly. It's certainly been the case that I mean. The last few years have been extremely intense, and it's very nice to think about things which are not infectious disease. Because yes. believe it or not, there are more things in the world than infectious disease. You know, there are things like, um, well, I mean, your mileage may vary, but for me, Arsenal Football Club is important. Mm -hmm. There's also coffee. Coffee is very good. I like coffee quite tremendously. Um fond of a number of other things, including, ooh, I don't know, what am I going to pick out of um, thin air? Mountaintops. Mountaintops are nice. I like mountaintops. Yep, I do too. I like um, snowboards. Uh, Snowmen. All right, we, we've, we've, all right, Arsenal. Um, I, look, Lionel and I, I think we know nothing about, about football. Yeah, um, if you, tell so us, if you look over my shoulder, can you see, well, where do I go? No, you can't see it because I turned the wrong well, way around. I see. A I, cuff. I have some gigantic. I have some gigantic Arsenal posters on my oh. wall. I saw like uh, medical equipment over there. No. Yeah. Oh, musical equipment. Oh, oh, musical equipment. Uh, oh. All yeah, right. So that's so, the logo. That's like the the great red cannon. Is that is yep. that what you mean? Yep. So um, I'm not really even much of a sports fan for like American sports, but um, what's oh, yeah, the American history? Sport, Amer so American sports are amazing. American sports are, with the possible exception of hockey, designed such that you can watch them while doing the ironing. Because basically, <laughs> there's enough. a point at which you kind of look, you, you know, you can look up and say, oh, which down is it? Um, oh, is it the, towards the end of the quarter? Whatever's going on. 
you know, how many balls, how many strikes, and decide whether or not to pay attention. And All then right, you now, look at the important points. Now, that's, that's fair and also not fair, because uh, England is also uh, one of the homes to cricket, which I believe, you know, you can you can watch while reading the Odyssey. I mean, that that's... Um, uh, believe, yes. You, yeah. you don't want to do the ironing while watching cricket, yes. You want to do something which is, you know... You Much could, slower. You could read the Odyssey or decompose or, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but not so some, football. I mean, yeah, football so, changes in a second. I mean, that's that's the thing. You don't want to miss <clears throat> that one moment where exactly. the goal happens. Exactly. Football yeah. or, or just to, to give it, just so you guys can understand what I'm talking about, soccer. Soccer. Is, soccer is one of those things which can change um, <laughs> really in an instant. And that's why, you know, it, I, you know, I like watching it because I like paying very intense attention to something for about 90 minutes. And so, um, yeah, I'm a fan of Arsenal Football Club. Arsenal Football Club are from North London. Mm. Uh, about 20 years ago, they were among the most dominant teams, not only the, in the Premiership, but, you know, the... the that had ever been known within the league. They and Manchester United at the time were duking it out right. every year, and they were about, shortly after, to embark upon a season in which they did not lose a single game mm. in the league, which is pretty amazing. They called them yeah. no, sort of the Invincibles. Since then, yeah, not so much. More, more pain and suffering, many years of pain and suffering, many years of seasonal Arsenal disorder. Um, <laughs> uh, but now... Now we are top of the league. We are top of the league. We've got a five-point cushion. We're there. And just at the point we're top of the league, everything is decided to just kind of, it's just stopping so, you know, people can go to Qatar and watch um, the World Cup, which is a disgraceful and dreadful thing that has happened in terms of all sorts of other situations. And uh, uh, FIFA's, I'm not going to say anything for reasons of... Uh, I, I have no idea whether he's, he's related to me. He's, you're probably referring to Gianni uh, Infantino. Uh, yes. Yeah, he's I, referring I no to idea. one of the most he powerful looks, organizations in the world. Yeah, and he, he looks FIFA. strangely like my brother. Um, but uh, and yeah, we really don't have style. Yeah, that's true. But I don't. I don't. You know, I don't walk around in a tracksuit. And um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I have no idea. But um, so so is is this. Are, is it not part of the global league? I mean, are you? Are you, Is it? Is Arsenal not playing? Uh, is, are they playing in a different arena? I, I don't know this. No, no. This is uh, 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 the World Cup is between countries. Ah, uh, okay. Between so countries. that's more the Arsenal Olympics also, of... And this is this is you know this is why I don't yeah you know, I don't really care about international football. Mm. Black Friday, the USA is going to be playing England in the World Cup, which is going uh. to make for very interesting things and you know some divided loyalties among me and my closest friends. Uh Normally, I think I'd be supporting the United States mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact that they're kind of underdogs. And normally, I don't like lots of players on the England side because they play for clubs that are not Arsenal. Yeah. But this year, there are a few really important Arsenal players in the side. It's a very young side, and that makes me feel a little bit more welcoming towards my native country. So it's it's a national team. Yeah. It's yeah. not that the the team that won inside that country then goes on to represent that country. It's no, so it's like the all star game team. in American baseball where they take a right. whole bunch of top players. Oh, oh okay. it's, it's very Yankees versus Red Sox. I understand that the Manchester United versus Arsenal. There's it's oh my a goodness, long standing yes. uh, uh, rivalry. Yeah, yeah. So now I understand it. Of course, I put it in. You know, it's you put the, it in Google, uh, didn't you? <laughs> you Google, you, you Google. I can see you Googling. I can Quickly. see there. There's a look. In, there's a look in people's eyes. There's a look in people's eyes when they're googling. It's like it's a yeah, it's a skill to be able to do it. No, I'm there's going in. I'm going in cold. I have no idea. What's there's going there's on. an interesting movie I saw a long time ago, The Damned United. Did oh you yeah, based yep, um, based on the um, David Peace book on Brian Clough's ill-fated right. um, <laughs> tenure as manager of Leeds. It's a great. It's a great movie. It's very. It's very low key. Um, it's a, it's based a, lo a large part of it is a buddy film. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's a really, really good book about, uh, this guy, and supposedly based upon fact where this guy was so possessed, um, this, this club manager was so possessed in his rivalry with this other manager, I guess his very famous manager of Man Manchester United. Um, and it just consumed him and almost destroyed his friendship. And, but it's very funny. It's a, it's a really and good he movie. Did, and he did extraordinary damage to Leeds United, which was the football club in question, in, the, in a rate of like, you know, 
40 something days, a kind of decline the likes of which has not been seen since until Liz Truss became prime minister <laughs> and then and then managed to make a few um, choices which may not have been entirely well advised. There Speaking should be a game, sorry, just and then Lionel, please. Uh, but there should be just just in commemoration, there should be a game played with a head of lettuce, I think. Yes. Yeah. That's true. And you, know, you play it until you know you play it until the lettuce falls apart. <laughs> just completely gone. Yeah. <laughs> now I was uh, reading an interview, I was reading the interview with Brian Eno today um, in the New York Times. A good interview. And oh. uh, they asked him about um, uh, fapping um, where people I'm dress sorry. up. This is a this is a family podcast. This is a family friendly. This is an all ages show. Now, what is it? It's it's um role, it's basically the the acronym for dressing up in costume and role playing as somebody. Is it? F A. I don't think it is. No, I, I don't think. think I think that's I'm, something else, Lionel. I'm gonna. I may have to Google that, but I may have to also put something on. How do I put things on I, private? Yeah, I don't think you want to. I don't think you want to Google that term exactly. It. Uh, well, anyway. I, uh, <laughs> okay. I know I'm, the I'm, word. I'm, I'm going to Google Brian it's Eno fapping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. But what he basically says, he says like role playing, and then he and then he he quoted some other person from England who said that um, the the Liz Truss um, era was basically a fapping uh, a <laughs> Margaret Thatcher fapping. <laughs> contest it has to be larping 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 larping, larping. larping. sorry larping. sorry yeah. larping fapping literally don't is get them confused yeah don't get them confused. wanking you know so um, oh, okay that's no, larping funny. he was talking about larping and, and he quoted this other guy who said liz truss was basically larping in a in a margaret thatcher themed show um which i thought was terribly amusing well, but that will anyway. be the title now of the podcast um that phrase. Um, <laughs> fabbing versus LARPing. No, no the uh, Liz Truss fabbing. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher fabbing the queen or whatever it was. <laughs> I'm afraid that's how it has to be now. Uh, uh, yeah. Where were we? <laughs> that's football. Football. Uh, football, football. Football. Football fabbing LARPing. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um. Is it the last time I was watching uh, football soccer? Uh, was uh, there was soccer? Soccer. There was a, um, a a continuous problem of, of faked injuries. Is that is there has anything been done to to quell that, or is that just part of strategy now? Well, yeah. I mean, it's always been. People always say that players are diving, or in this country, mm -hmm. people call it flopping. Flopping, and not to be confused. Yeah. <laughs> with fa um, fapping. Right? Yeah. Or LARPing. LARPing, flopping, flapping. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, people, there's always, there's always an issue there. But one, one of the things which is really interesting is that you can note how some players, it's like, oh, you can see that he's using his experience there, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, he's using his experience. He's being very clever. Right. Very clever. Very strategic move. Very strategic, just mm. jumping. Out. He's looking for the contact, goes down in the box. That's a penalty. That's a penalty. Oh, yeah, he made a lot of it. But yeah. And then other players, it's like, oh, he's, he's, he's dirty. He is. He's dirty. What oh. was the difference? Generally, generally foreign or, oh, uh, wow. or otherwise, um, you know, I, otherwise a minority of some kind. That's like, you know, there's a real kind of, there's oh, wow. a real sort of tension within that. But it's, you know. It's changed over the years, and it, ha it has changed somewhat. We, there, it's also possible for a player to get booked, like penalised for simulation. Oh, okay. Simulation, simulation, simulation. Lionel, not stimulation. Right. Mm. Much um, like larping, and, though. Yeah. Much larping, like larping and injury. Yeah. Yeah, larping and injury. Yes, basically life. Yeah. You should bring that live action, role, live action yeah. role playing. I'll talk to my cousin. And uh, there's a whole there's a concerned. whole thing that you can um, if if you or your listeners want to. Um, want to google it there's a whole phenomenon called john terry full kit wanker uh which <laughs> is kind of bringing this whole full circle i can tell the references page it's just going to be disgusting for this, for this <laughs> podcast um uh, so um so i uh i did want to ask you about you know um you've you've been in the states for a long time i'm delighted that uh you still sound like you're from london which is great are you originally from London, or am I, I actually, misplacing it? No, I I grew up in. Um, I don't think I'm misplacing it. I grew up in Cornwall, which is oh, is wow. a long way away. But um, I have 
spent you know more time living in or around London than anywhere else. Um, really, and you know, I certainly view myself as being more at home there than anywhere else. Well, so yeah, well, Cornish accent is actually much different. Oh, um, very, very, and I but know that you, from watching too much Doc Martin. Uh, yeah, you can. You, well, yeah, you can. You can hear it in. Yeah, I mean, not to get too accent nerdy, you can hear right. it in my A's. Okay. Like I tend to say, I don't say I'm um, bath or anything like right. that. I right, say right. I say bath or some which is a bit flatter. Which uh, closer to New England, is, too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, people often think it's because the influence of America on me, but actually, it's it's just it's much deeper than that. Wow. Um, where was I going with uh, London? Oh, no, um, I, I oh, yes. In, and you've been in America for a long time. Uh, that's where I was going, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but still, uh, uh, here we are about to have a holiday. Um, sorry, not a holiday. I guess, well, I don't know what you call it. What do you call it in England when you have a holiday? A holiday is like when you go away on vacation, but it, they, holiday here it, is like... It, it would be like a bank holiday or something like a that. A bank holiday, okay. So, yeah. so we're having a bank holiday for Thanksgiving, and, and I, I, I don't know how that is. You know, I mean, uh, it's sort of a distinctly... Yankee holiday. Um, yeah. Does it? Does it have any? I mean, do you do you, do you celebrate it? British where you people are? celebrate <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs> British British people in Britain do not celebrate Thanksgiving. No? We do not celebrate mm. Thanksgiving. No, no. Mm. We have a we we um um we kind of well depending on what you do for a living you sort of send emails to people you work with in the United States and wonder where the hell they've gone for the <laughs> right you know, for, four for several days. days. Yeah. Much like Americans email people in England for most of the month of December wondering where they've gone. And the answer is they're all drunk because it's like <laughs> running up, it's running up to Christmas. Um, and then they're sleeping it off. Right. And, and if they can go to Spain, then they, then yeah. they Spain. Yeah. And the, I mean, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's a really kind of lovely holiday because of the fact that it is a national holiday. It's entirely secular. It's got a kind of like, and you know, giving thanks mm -hmm. is a very nice thing. It's also a bit kind of, if you think about the origins and the ideas mm. of it, uh, maybe not altogether particularly something we might want to celebrate now. But as far as I recall, and this may be me being just, just a, like a British person being knowing something about my adopted home, I don't think it was actually declared a national holiday until sometime in the middle of the 20th century or something comparatively I think it was um, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, it was Lincoln who did it. Was it Lincoln who declared a Thanksgiving? I think Lincoln came up with the idea of Thanksgiving and it became like a national holiday in the 40s or something. I may yeah. be wrong, but it's like... No, that sounds that sounds correct to me. But yeah, yeah it's a relatively it was recent invention. The National Turkey Council that um, yes. started it. <laughs> that is actually not farmers. true. And I, I actually was sure for a while that Turkey was not like the traditional meal, or it was not the original meal, you know, uh, in the that the pilgrims enjoyed with the Wapanag uh, Indians, but uh, it was actually it turns out. Yeah, they had a lot of seafood as well because yeah, there was oysters. just lying around. Um, hadn't all been yeah. fished out. So um, in, in Britain, though, the, you know, the whole turkey thing is um, turkey is what you eat at Christmas. Oh, uh, yeah. Of course. And I, so I, I, you know, I've, you know, I don't like turkey. I'm not particularly fond of turkey at the best time, so I just I'm not use it as an excuse to make something else. Yeah. No, we stopped eating it at Thanksgiving. We just stopped. We're not going to do it. What do you do instead? Uh, something we like. I mean, the girl. Uh, half of that's us are sort of pescatarians. That's always a good idea. That's a, yeah. that's a radical that's, idea. Making something we like. you like. No, a holiday should be eating <laughs> well, something is. that you that make that you don't like with people <laughs> in your family who you have to be with. That's right. Some dry piece of, you know, bird that you just can't quite get down with some yeah. stuffing. The stuffing you like, of course. So, but we like the stuffing. We're going to keep the stuffing and have it with like um, salmon or something. With a, a monkfish roulade. Yeah, sure. That sounds good. Yeah. A stuffed salmon stuffed with uh, oysters, maybe. Mm. I can think of somebody in this house who would like that. There you go. There you go. You're allowed. And you're doubly allowed because, you know. England. Yeah, England. Yeah, because people England. think that English people think that English yeah, Americans tend to think that English people um are eccentric and <laughs> uh and have and are reserved. And it's this weird thing. Actually, so if I were to ask you guys, do you think of British people as being polite or not polite? It's a complicated question for me. Lionel. 
my experiences traveling in the UK have been the people have always been very polite to me, but people have always been very polite to me in every country I go to. You do have one of those faces. No, I don't. People are either polite <laughs> to you or, or may, maybe they, I don't know. It just may be that I lived in Philadelphia for 25 years. So any place where people are not like actively threatening me with a firearm, I consider like a really nice place to hang out. Yeah. Uh, but no, I always, I always, I always had a good, good time in, in over, everywhere, honestly. But I was in London, what, six years ago? Mm. Um, everything was fine. I, and I would say, so my, my answer to that would be, maybe before I went to England, I would have said uh, reserved and polite. And then uh, I went to England, and I really experienced a variety of so many different like personalities throughout the island that I, it, you know, it's, it's, it's up in the air. Some people are very polite, some people are totally vulgar and uh i i had there was i mean there was an there was an incident where i was in hull um which i think we decided to call the tour to hull and back after that which i'm sure we're not the first <laughs> and um uh, it was actually a fantastic club there and uh we were staying somewhere and walking around the town at night and uh, a woman came up to us and said now, what do you think of hull and i said well yeah i don't know we've we've had a great time at the club and she's like it's rubbish isn't it it's rubbish <laughs> Like, okay, yeah, it's rubbish. Yeah, sure. If you like. Very proud. Very proud. <laughs> I, I was on. A, I was. I was in Liverpool a few um, months ago, and had a w wonderful time there. But one of one of the one of the high points was a tour on the Mersey, and the local guide um, was very proud of things about Liverpool. And to be fair, Liverpool has a lot to be proud of. But one of the things she pointed out was like, you know, these are these enormous piles of scrap metal you can see are some of the largest piles of scrap metal in the country. And I'm just like, well, yep. Yeah. Well, you there, know, there you go. Work with what you got. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure the Magna Carta is coming, but, you know, until then. <laughs> um, the, I mean, the reason I ask is that, you know, when I'm, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, when I moved here, I actually had to. I had to stop cursing in like every sentence and it took me really? quite a long time. And even now my daughter has learned to look at me and say, you were self editing there, weren't you? Yeah. Because there'll be like a little pause at the, at the, at the stage where it would have been. And then it, and then I just carry on. But, what, but yeah, like, when oh, I said, you, but okay. why, why, why did you feel the need to, to, to curtail your cursing? Because I feel like Americans are so polite and professional. Really? And all sorts really? Of like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're at Harvard. Oh, yeah. No, you trust me. You're you're living you're living in a bubble. Yeah. Well, yeah. At work. I mean, when I'm talking. We to all my live friends, in bubbles, but you yeah. live in a very nice bubble with people who typically it's, don't it's, use the f word every other third word in a sentence. Well, it does depend on the circumstances and when you're talking to them, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know I, a good a good friend of mine recently said that he had uh, decided to try and stop using it, and he got two days. <laughs> <laughs> and then I won't say exactly what pushed him over the edge, but it was yeah, it was it was the kind of thing that you might expect. And then he found um, that the words that he had not said didn't actually dissipate or evaporate; they were all stored up inside of him. So yeah. when he finally <laughs> let go, it all came out in one it's big like, it's blast. It's like a volcano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah. didn't think of myself as being someone who cursed all the time, and my wife certainly didn't. And then we had kids, and then we realized we got to do something about this. You know, then we started to hear ourselves do it all the time when they started to understand the language, and uh, it was hard, actually. Yeah, my 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 um. I will edit like, yeah. My three year old daughter first said the phrase, which is often abbreviated to FFS. Oh, yeah. At yeah. the age of three. <laughs> and entirely correctly within context and everything. Uh, and I didn't react. Um, and she didn't say anything like it until she was nine. Hmm. Yeah. So, that's, I mean, that's also, that's also a good strategy, is not to, not to get too wound up about it because then they know it's a word of power now yeah now she uses it all the time yeah yeah one word to rule them all yeah uh, <laughs> uh speaking hey, of accents i yeah. think i told you uh, I, I think i told you i've 
uh, I've been catching up on TV recently and things that have been happening. I've been watching The Boys, yeah. which is terrifying. It's and a horrific, a really unhappy show. Oh, it is such an unhappy show. I really unhappy. Guess who? Guess who recommended it to me, Lionel? You can guess. Really unhappy, like dystopic John Infantino. World. John Infantino, my brother. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had to stop so, watching it. It was toxic. I really, I had to stop watching it. I had to, I had to watch it because my brother told me to watch it. So I, I do everything he says. But yeah, Bill, uh, you're talking about Billy the Butcher, right? Yeah, I, I de- yeah. I've developed a sort of fascination with whatever his accent is. It's, I, I, it's, it's fascinating. It's Dick Van Dyke by way of Auckland, and it's got this sort of it's yeah. Yeah. I remember I watched like two episodes. I was thinking, "What the hell is that?" And it's some, it's got its own kind of like it's not an accent. It's it's <laughs> performance art. It's like a it's it's the sort of thing which could develop its own weather systems. It's extraordinary. It's just such a mammoth thing which uh, you know. I mean, I, and I can't so where take do you think my ears away from it. How did he put it together? I mean, the actor. I mean, I, I know that actor. Uh, is that no, where's that actor uh, originally from? He, he's from New Zealand, and he's um, and so you can, you can oh, sort of hear the vowels in there, and he kind of goes. Right. But then it's like, and it, you'll hear something which is like completely like you know, you think that's all right, that's okay, and then suddenly, Ooh. and obviously, I'm particularly attuned to it because of the fact that I'm, I'm, the, I'm, uh, I'm from there originally. But no, also, you, you have like, to come clean on this. It's because he uses the c word constantly. He does. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Which, but to be you, fair, is also quite a London thing. Yeah, and how uh, did, all over and, England? Uh, I heard it. I, you know, it's normal. How do you Sorry, think London. he constructed it? I mean, what do you think is the? Did he? I mean, do you think it's an intentional thing to create this Franken accent? Or I think I, I, I cannot speak for the uh, actor, but I think that I suspect that he was cast, and then he decided that we're just going to do that. And he's just like, I'm going to lean into this, and I'm yeah. going to be as big a baddie as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to be bigger. <laughs> you got it. Uh, uh, this I, is Car- I, Carl Urban, by the way. It's a, yeah, 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 it's Carl, Carl oh, Urban. So, so he's, amazing. And he's like, I think that that's what he's doing. And he's like, you know, I know it's not perfect, but I'm going to enjoy my flaws. Do you think it's a New Zealander's idea of an Australian accent? I'm not sure, but a New Zealander's idea of an Australian accent. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, you think it's an it's a New Zealander's idea of like a like of a, a sort London. of London accent? But you know, yeah. like to, to quote to quote the flight of the Concords, you know, um, <laughs> you know, Australian accents they sound just like us, only evil. <laughs> Present. Um, Present. Yes. 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 Um, yeah, well, I, I'll tell you, I, I mean, I, I'd certainly watch it for him. Yeah, I mean, without him, I don't think that show would be watchable. I think he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a hundred percent. And, and of course the actor who plays, um, the, uh, the supreme bad guy, um. Who was also a oh, Kiwi. Psychotic. Oh, is he really? Yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah, yeah. New Zealand, a small, a small, um, country which has done great things for the world and produced very many important people. Yeah, well. Okay, I mean, I know Flight of the Concords. Well, lots of other places have to. Yeah. Carl Flight Ernest Concords. Rutherford. Uh-huh. One of Peter the greatest. Jackson. No, right. oh, Peter Jackson's from New Zealand. Is he? Let me check. Let me check. I might be, I might be confused. Well, the landscape is certainly from the, the landscape is, yes. So, yeah. You know, whatever he is, um, <laughs> his, his la- and it's obviously his landscape. My, my hoodie's from New Zealand. It's, uh, it's one of those uh, icebreaker uh, hoodies. Yeah, he's, he's a Kiwi. He oh. is. Wow. Yep, obviously, very you know, and unusually, uh, and a very impressive country in terms of what it's producing. Yeah, I've collaborated with folks in New Zealand for a few years. A few of um, if any of you have been on Twitter and seen a lady called Susie Wiles, who's a microbiologist in mm-hmm. Auckland, pink hair, you know, excellent science communicator, really, really cool. And I worked with her. Actually, had a paper which has been just submitted. And um, so, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm going back to science and work. I don't want to talk about science. It's totally up to you. I mean, I, I just don't want to. Well, I'm fascinated by science communicators. Mm-hmm. So you say Susie Wiles is a great science communicator. Do you have Do you have other people, contemporary contemporary people that you think are just really? I'm always I'm always fascinated by this topic of people who can explain science. So. I mean, one person, this is not going to be a particular surprise, and a lot of folks will have followed 
well, follow him anyway, Ed Yong has done a phenomenal um, job in terms of the pandemic of the Atlantic. And he's written a bunch of really good books. He's written, um, I mean, his latest book is just out. It's, um, I keep seeing it in the bookstore and I can't remember what it's about. Sorry, Ed. Mm. Um, but he did write a, he wrote a book about the microbiome, which was superb. I contain multitudes. Um, and his most recent one is, I think, about animal signals or something like that. But he's, you know, he's a fen- he's a phenomenal writer. You just anything that he picks up, anything that he uh, writes is worth um, worth reading. And Lionel, you don't need to write these down. I, have, I put them all up on the references. Page. I'm writing them for myself, so <clears throat> I can go out and buy them. It's okay. Young. How, how do I spell the last no, name? I'll put it on the oh, references. Why okay. Sorry. Yep. Just click the all link, right. man. Come okay, on. fine. Yeah, so, fine. You know, those, that has to be good for someone. I think you're the only one, really, who's going to go through all that stuff. So. Mm-hmm. And half of it you mentioned. So Susie um, and Ed, anybody else that you think people should be checking out in terms of explaining contemporary science issues? So I think um, I'm. So there's a woman who I've never actually heard her name said, but I think she's. I've been. I read her stuff and she's great. Hope Jaren or Hope Yaren, who's now in Oslo. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, I've been really. I thought she's. Her work has been amazing for years. I'm just really, really impressed by that. Um, she wrote the great book called um, Lab Girl a few years ago. Okay. Which was which is definitely worth reading. Um, one of the best, it's not about science, but one of the best books, well, it's not science communication, but one of the best novels I've read about science um, is called Intuition. Mm. Uh, it's by a woman called Allegra Goodman, I think. Uh, it's actually set in Cambridge. And and is it about, uh, what is it about like a, well, I mean, most fiction novels are about some fictional disease that that gets out of hand but is this that sort of thing or something else oh th- this is this is a novel in which we're set in a lab researching cell biology and one of the people makes a finding which could have huge significance for the study and treatment of cancer oh. and the question is is it real or not and everybody oh. wants to believe it's real and then some people start to question whether it is real, and everything starts to go pear shaped from then on. You mean what and if so it is? It, what if it is real? It, maybe, if it's real, fantastic. Everybody's going to be rich. Well, who's going to get the credit? If it's uh, not real, how long is this going to be happening before everything falls apart? And it's a very and it's a I mean it's a fascinating uh, analysis of the real way that people do science. I mean, people often think this is one of the things which has been interesting about being a scientist the last few years. The ways in which we, uh, the ways in which we do science usually, are ways in which we show people the end product as opposed to the process. But in reality, mm. you normally don't get there by the route that you know. You don't know where you're going, and so you're spending a period of time like groping around in the dark. And the whole point about science as a process is it enables you to hold on to the things which are most real and most important. That's that's why it works. But when you're actually seeing that happening in real time, people can sometimes feel kind of uncomfortable. If somebody says to me, does ivermectin work? I can I would be able to say to you from the bat, well, probably not, but it's not completely crazy. And then after a little while, I'd say, no, actually, there isn't any evidence for it. Damn. Right. Sorry, forget it. Right. You know. And they'll cite so you for the first time that you talk, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And then you sort of get the, um, you know, similar things happen with hydroxychloroquine, although hydroxychloroquine, there was always good reason to think that it would have some very serious side effects. Right. But at the same time, there are people doing great research with, uh, there's a, you know, cheap medication called dexamethasone, which is really effective at treating severe COVID. And I say really effective, it's not so effective that we can just relax. No, mm-hmm. but we found out that it was a way of improving outcomes as early as June 2020. Right. And that's a real thing. Doesn't mean that we can just you know relax, but it is a big development that was very helpful. And all these things get you rolling around, t- turning over in people's minds, and they can't figure out what to trust, what not to trust, and so on. And then everything has become more and more crazily politicized. I have two. I have two directions I want to go, and I know you know we probably can go on too long. But but I, one is how. Do you have a theory on how the ivermectin thing got started? What was it? And I'm just breaking my rule and going right into COVID here. But um, 
How are you going to ivermectin? Ivermectin isn't well. It's only got something to do with COVID because of the um, because yeah. of the, way, the wider context. Well, but yeah, because it's on podcasts where you know people are saying it's a you know it's great. Um, uh, it's a great treatment. But but was it just was it? What, do you think there was a doctor behind that? Do you think there was just some guy trying it out because he had a farm or? Well, well so to give the to give the sort of background to this, it's not crazy when you're faced with a new disease with a pathological process which is not entirely well understood to think that some things of this kind might have some efficacy. Okay. But you have to have evidence. You need evidence. Right. And then if that evidence isn't forthcoming, at some point you've just got to hold up your hands and go, uh, would have been a nice idea, but it didn't work. Right. The thing is that people want to believe stuff so much. And one of the things that people really want to believe is that there's like a simple way out of the nightmare yeah. of the last few years. And that's the which offers it. And it's, in fact, it's a thing which um, the world and the United States in particular has been really hung up on, like... I wrote a thing about a year ago in the Washington Post, I think, saying, commenting that, um, I was saying, you know, we keep looking around for, you know, you know fix your pandemic with this one simple trick, mm -hmm. you know, discovered, right. by a, discovered by a mom in Somerville, you know, it's got a yep. geolocated thing. It's trying to say that it's like, um, you know, drop and do, your, saggy, and do, your, and do your sagging arms at the same time, <laughs> or whatever it is. And, you know, other people yeah. may not get those ads, but, uh, you know, I'm old enough that I do. Um, and, and there isn't a simple trick to do those things. Just like most of this stuff, it's like the, the closest thing to a simple trick is vaccines. Mm -hmm. The In reality, just like in most things in life, we have a bunch of things that we can do to make things better rather than one thing, which is a button you push and suddenly everything's hunky-dory. And that's what we have to, you know, that's what we keep trying to do, keep moving towards better helping people get towards better, making it easy for people to get towards better. Yeah. That's the daily grind, um, which has been going on a while. And yeah, I'm a bit tired of, but you know, I'm not going <laughs> to let up. Well, we appreciate that. Um, my talk father, about, let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about something completely unconnected and silly now. Yes, I agree. I was wondering, um, we do talk a lot about uh, science fiction and, um, you know, uh, I don't want to get back into the medical stuff, but um, are, are there any are there any books about plagues that you find you know sort of compelling or that you've read? <laughs> that, well, I'm thinking of like the White Plague was a Frank Herbert book that I read a long time ago that I thought was oh Frank Herbert Frank Herbert Frank Herbert was the um, Frank Herbert was the writer that all of the kids and all the boys in my school um, used to read because of the fact that there always seemed to be a sex scene somewhere around page 80, I think it was. Oh, they're horrible, horrible sex scenes. They're, they're terrible. Oh, God. Ugh. Sorry. Just, they just, they are repulsive. Yes. Um, and, and, and so <laughs> adolescent <laughs> boys, uh, <laughs> always written for. Um, so let's think of Frank Herbert. There's, there's a book which, um, there's a, there's a really, really I don't want to say awful because I don't want to be too mean to the um, author um, book, which I found during my PhD, which is about an outbreak of pneumonic plague. In, in you know, plague, Yersinia pestis, but spread by, you know, yes, a respiratory plague okay. in New York City. That's something which I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it made me, um, it, it stayed with me. Okay. <laughs> 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 la laughing and coughing at the same time in tribute. Um and of course, you know, as, you know, people who've, um, you know, seen what I've written about in various places will know I'm a big fan of Albert Camus. And so La Peste oh, is, you know, the, the, the Plague is a great book in very many ways. Not only, it's not so much that it's a necessarily a scientifically accurate description of a particular disease, but it's very good at what people feel like and how yeah. they respond to it. What happens to the yeah, what, to the What community. happens to people, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, people, you know, one, one of the things which I keep, one of the things which I always come back to is that these little buggers don't want, necess they don't really want to hurt us most of the time. I mean, we're just real estate. Um, we, <laughs> yeah. we don't, they don't, they don't care. It's, there's nothing, there's nothing malicious. They're just trying to do their thing. And uh, what we as humans should do is 
not help them <laughs> when we when we suffer as a result. Um, right. And it's and I think that the Lampers managed to capture that extremely well. Mm. Um, and then there are some other. I mean, I remember, you know, uh, was it various zombie movies and things like that as well. <laughs> zombies are zombies are actually a pretty. You can actually make there. There is some scientific literature which you know looks at the mathematics of the spread of zombie plagues. I've been mm. reading the mathematics of zombie plagues. Yes, and there's some there's some argument about whether, like, if you look at like The Walking Dead. Whether they mm. actually do run out of zombies, mm. you know, given mm. given you have like say it claims ninety nine percent of the population, well then how many zombies do each of the survivors need to kill without being killed and turned to, turned into a zombie themselves? There's ultimately there's like a dwindling amount of fuel. This 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 is infectious disease epidemiology. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Gamify it. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Well, there is there is actually there was a website a few. Um, uh, I wrote a blog about it a long time ago. There was a website um, that was saying, you know, in order to prevent the zombie outbreak, you actually have to, you know, you have to destroy city blocks around the original zombie outbreak mm, in order to yep. produce a fire break, effectively. Right. And you say that that's a, you know, you might um, say that's a, a joke or what have you, but in ooh, 20 years ago, in the country I grew up in, in um, the United Kingdom, there was a huge outbreak of foot and mouth disease virus, which is a thing which it's, a, it's an economically important disease. It's cattle, made it, right? Yes, cattle, that's right. Yeah. It, it, it infects cattle and I'm actually running, a, I'm running something about it in class tomorrow. And it's incredibly infectious. And it meant that the country would not be able to sell its you know, meat abroad or anything. They'd be banned exports and so on. And so it cost billions, but the part of the response was to do a cull of cattle, not only, right. yeah. Yeah, not only in the farms which had the outbreak, but in mm. those around them on yep. the assumption that there were probably infectious cattle there already, but just hadn't been detected yet. Yeah, so, so maybe if we explained it all with zombies, maybe that would yeah, be Yeah, zombies are the way effective. to go. Yeah. But zombies are the way to go. Don't take that out of context. We, um, I believe, actually, the, the foot and mouth disease issue was active when I was there. I remember yeah, there was well. some, you had to, like, step on a mat or something. It, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's odd, yeah. And then it affected uh, cattle prices and beef prices, and uh, it's kind of a big deal. Big deals. Yeah. Um, but there are. But it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a. It just goes to show how interesting and how relevant these things are, even when they're not kind of just making all our lives um, turn upside down for a few years. So, is it possible? It does. Yeah. No, is it possible to do? Because it's, it's fascinating what you, you touched on something I thought was really interesting, which is um, not a game, but you know, a computer simulation, an app that you can download on your phone, where you can say things like you can set parameters and say, okay. 30% of the population is going to agree to social distancing and 30% of the population is going to agree to wear a mask and I'm, and you set these different parameters and then you hit go and see how the simulation goes and how and and the spread um uh, for people to educate themselves on these yeah. things to yeah. see yeah. There, are, stuff like that. there are some sh there are some shiny apps that you can do that with there's a thing at the Museum of Science here in Boston which enables okay. you to do that which I'm, I know some of the people who are involved in setting that up. Um, and that is indeed quite a lot of the sort of thing that we would do. The question always is knowing what the relevant numbers are before you put them in. That's, what, that's what's tough. Um, right. Because you want to know how exactly infectious people are, and that can change over time in particular because, you know, we change the types of contacts we make. Um, but there is, and when you're talking about that, Lionel, there was a point a few years ago where somebody released a plague in World of Warcraft, oh. and it kind of it escaped, and it started. And then somebody actually wrote up an article in the Lancet about it, talking about how this was a model for infectious disease. And I remember responding and something saying, "Well, yeah, but in World of Warcraft, different characters can die of it multiple times because it's a computer game and not a real world." Right. Um, but it's a yeah, but it's things like that. 
I know at least one person who got into the field by playing The Sims. Yeah. And then thinking, I want, to, I, want to do, I want to do The Sims, and then I want to put things on top of it, and you know, and see what happens with disease transmission. Did they? Yeah, um, I, yeah sorry. Is ahead. there like a plague plugin for The Sims, or not that I'm aware of? If there were, my daughter would have found it by now. There, there has to. This is. There needs to be like a Minecraft plague uh, plugin. There needs. It just needs to be a plague plugin on all the games. I say. Yeah, maybe not all of them. Otherwise, I won't be able to play any of them. Be too much like a <laughs> right. Christmas holiday. <laughs> I, I'm here to relax. Darn it. Yeah. I'm looking. Warcraft Plague there. Corrupted Blood, that's what it's called. Ah. And how can that even happen? I mean, so I guess I don't want to get too deeply into it, but somebody made a mod of some sort? Um, I believe it was... Um, I'm quoting from Wikipedia here. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do my... I'm going to do my uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this in my sort of NPR voice. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Let's do it. World of Warcraft introduced the game region of Zulgurub on September 13th. The boss of the region, Hakar the Soul Flayer, <laughs> cast corrupted blood on raid participants. The debuffs effects expired when players defeated Hakar. <laughs> corrupted blood soon spread beyond Zulgurub as players reacted to the infection with panic. <laughs> See what I mean? It's like, you know, it, um, <laughs> oh, look, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Some of the epidemiologists, meanwhile, took interest in how massively multiplayer online role-playing games, unlike mathematical models, could capture individual human responses to disease outbreaks <laughs> rather than govern generating assumptions about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Human responses to disease outbreaks are probably different if you're a level 80 blood elf maid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's Sla the trick. We just all have to be level 80 blood blood elf mages. Yeah. And we'll be yeah. fine. We can cast that health spell over and over again in our <laughs> sleep. Yeah. But I was just thinking of it as an educational tool because one of the problems with the whole COVID experience we're going through is that it is complex. Yeah. And, and the tricky part is that back in 1918 or 1940, you, you didn't have the internet at your fingertips. You, you had a couple of newspapers, maybe you had a, three television channels, but basically you're told to listen to the guy in the white coat and yeah. do what he told you to do. And that seemed to work pretty well, but now everybody can hit the, can hit Wikipedia and start to ask questions and yep. when they start asking questions, complexity starts to erupt. And, and it's like, asking, well, there's, you know, there's a the thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. There's acquired immunity and then there's going to be more variants. And then there's the effect of social distancing and, and all these different things we can do. And people are like, and I think people, a lot of people fritzed out um, because there is, there, you, you can't just use ivermectin. There isn't a pill, one pill that you can take. So the thing here, I think, is that asking questions is great. It's a great place to start, but it's not a great place to finish. Mm. You know, in order to finish, you need to know which answers mm -hmm. you can trust. You've got to be able to figure out between them and make sure that you're not getting bent out of shape, believing someone just because they they sound right or because they're saying what you want to believe. Right. So, you know, one of the people who's been amazing in um, uh, sort of communicating that the last few years is a guy at um, uh, University of Washington called Carl Bergstrom. Who mm -hmm. wrote a book called Calling Bullshit? Okay. And it's about figuring out, you know, what and you know, the ways in which people try to manipulate how we feel about stuff to make us feel that something is sciencey and but it's actually BS. Right. And I think that that's a really important skill to have. And you know, we don't you know, lots of people don't have it. I mean, I, I read that did either of you read that great book a few years ago, Thinking Fast and Slow? Yes. No. I do not. That, it's Several great, times. It's a great book. I really recommend it. What's interesting, I found, is that you know I have spent actually <laughs> this computer is resting on a copy of it. <laughs> um, um, I it, it's it's about the ways in which our brains trick us. Um, the you know the thinking fast mm. in ways where evolutionarily useful or and you can see are adaptive. But then on reflection, you realize that they were wrong. A lot of statistics is about trying to get that second. That second order thing, you know, the thinking slow and yeah. operationalizing it. Um, and while I read it, I was kind of thinking, I was fascinated at the number of times I was caught out. Mm. And I've spent most of my adult life trying to not be. Right. And 
to be, you know, to be sure there were occasions where I was just looking at it and going, oh yeah, 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 I can see that, I can see that, I can see that, that's fine. And then sometimes I just suddenly think, oh my goodness, I'm just as, I'm just as messed up in thinking about this as anyone. And mm -hmm. that made me feel like I've just got to be all the more careful at not getting high on my own supply and being very careful about what I think is, uh, you know, thinking very carefully about my science and all the work I do. And not just science, other things as well. But what I want to know is, um, when will Billy Butcher make an appearance on Doctor Who? That's, oh. I think that is the, some, there's got to be an episode somehow. That would be kind of, oh my God. Billy Butcher versus um, Jack um, Harkness. Jack Harkness, yeah. yes. The be man like who can't kind of, be killed. The man who can't be killed versus... <laughs> <laughs> the killer. <laughs> versus the man... Versus the man who's action can't be kept <laughs> um, What, you're up again? Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Great, I'll get to kill you again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this a second time. Uh, <laughs> this time we're feeling... <laughs> I don't I've, know if I can do. Can, can, I don't know if I can do Captain Jack. Captain Jack. He's Captain tricky. Jack's got this kind of hard. He's got this kind of like, hey, everybody. He's got this kind of homeland type of. Thing he's like a on. peppier Tom Cruise. You know, there's a. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's really the face of Bo. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I love all this. Stuff. Yeah, I'm 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 very into. It. I've seen. I think I've seen all of the new. I mean, of course, I haven't seen all of the old. The old. That's like that's really getting into it. If you if you watch all the Tom Baker ones and all the ones before that, and and uh, but starting in was it nineteen ninety Eccleston, um, from that to the present, I've seen. Yeah, I've, I've just I just got up to date like a couple nights ago, actually. Ah, uh, ah. so yeah, you're just there. Not going to give any spoilers to anybody who's not seen it. My daughters walk around the house going da 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 Delia oh, yeah. Derbyshire, the iconic, the the woman who made the theme music for Doctor oh. Who was Delia Derbyshire and the BBC Radiophonic Laboratory, and that is that is an absolutely iconic electronic music uh, piece of work. It's Everybody a theremin, refers to isn't that. it? Is it a theremin, or it's are they using a, a really, portamento on the on a keyboard? I keep thinking about that. I'm not sure, but it, she went to it like. It was being done in 1963. She was she. It was incredibly laborious to create that song. Yeah, um, but it's a really cool tune. Everybody awesome. loves it. There's a great thing on YouTube where they play all the different versions of it. It's been variously goosed from season to season. Mm. There's been different interpretations. So it's a great tune. It's a it's a perhaps that that's part of the <laughs> part of the legs of the entire series. But yeah, Delia Derbyshire. Everybody, everybody. If you're into electronic music and synthesizers. She's right up there with Bob Moog um, and yeah, all, all the great electronic, uh, all the like, all the pioneers in that field. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna, it's gonna take me days to do the to do the references on this one. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm uh, gonna, well I'm, worth I've it. Got, I've got one to add. All right. Um, yeah, um, Bill Bailey does a um, like a the, the the Doctor Who theme reimagined as Belgian jazz. <laughs> <laughs> key is Doctor Key. <laughs> Doctor. Doctor Key. Il voyage dans le temps de l'espace, dans le Tardis. <laughs> Il est très mystérieux. <laughs> uh, yeah, all well, that, and all with this kind of. In the back. <laughs> is it? Is it le médecin? Le médecin qui? Is that or is it? Uh, ah, I wonder. Doctor Key. Yeah, key well, doctor. He's talking about his medicine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to go back into medicine. I'm not going to stay. No, no, let's keep away from that I have, one. I have, I, have, I have betrayed my mission here, and I, I apologize. I'm going well. to have to dash because I need to go and have some, yeah. um, some food. It's a Thank real pleasure to see you. It's lovely to meet you, Lionel. Likewise. Thank you. Absolutely. Jim. Coffee. Blood, we will, we coffee. will do, we'll have coffee sometime soon. Absolutely.
The Funny Not Funny Podcast is produced by me, Jim Infantino. Music by Jim's Big Ego. You can find it wherever podcasts are found or at funnynotfunny.bigego.com. Please leave a rating or review.